Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing through the singing of our national anthem by Miss Ani Kithcart and the invocation by Chaplain Corwin Smith. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air That our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave? invite you to now please join me in prayer. Mighty God, as we gather for this ceremony today, we understand the significance of this day in the year 1920. Women were granted the right to vote. Since that day, their vote, voice, and thoughts have been crucial to our nation. They have been and are an integral part of the, su of the success we have accomplished as a nation. And we're thankful, Lord, that you have allowed this opportunity to celebrate this moment for which this day represents. May we also take time to remember the sacrifices of many of those pioneers that fought to make this day we witness now a reality. For many of them, you, O oh Lord, were their strength to endure during the hardships for the vision of equality you place in their hearts. As we commemorate this day, may we be reminded of our responsibilities we have as citizens with the privileges we have been afforded. Help us to appreciate and utilize our rights and privileges for the betterment of our families, nation, and the world. We humbly ask your blessing upon this day and this time. In your holy name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Kithcart and Chaplain Smith. You may be seated. Welcome to the 2015 Women's Equality Day. The theme for this great occasion is celebrating women's right to vote. I am Ms. Amanda Owens, your Mistress of Ceremony for today's event. The sponsors of today's program are the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and the United States Strategic Command Center for Combating Weapons of Mass Destruction and the Standing Joint Force Headquarters for Elimination Joint Command, the Defense Logistics Agency, the Defense Contract Agency, the Defense Technical Information Center, as well as our Equal Employment Opportunity Offices. It is my honor to introduce to you Mr. Kenneth Myers, Director, Defense Threat Reduction Agency and United States Strategic Command Center for Combating Weapons of Mass Destruction. Well, good morning. Beautiful day. Great opportunity uh, to be here today, and I'm pleased that so many of you have joined us this morning. Women's Equality Day 
commemorates American women achieving full voting rights under the U.S. Constitution by passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. It is an honor to introduce our guest speaker. Admiral Michelle Howard has achieved many historical firsts throughout her naval career. She is the first female four-star admiral in the Navy's history and serves as the Vice Chief of Naval Operations. She was the first African-American woman to achieve the three-star rank and the four-star rank in the U.S. Armed Services. She graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1982 and from the Army's Command and General Staff College in 1998 with a Master's in Military Arts and Sciences. She took command of the USS Rushmore on March 12, 1999, becoming the first African-American woman to command a ship in the United States Navy. Admiral Howard deployed to Indonesia for tsunami relief efforts, participated in maritime security operations in the North Arabian Gulf, and served, commander, served as commander of a counter-piracy task force where she led the rescue of the merchant vessel Maersk, Alabama, from Somali pirates. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Michelle Howard. Please have a seat. That may have been premature. <laughs> All right. So this is actually a brand new presentation. So if you don't like it, give me feedback. Um, but uh, first of all, Ken, thank you for inviting me to come speak. And I have generally end up speaking on Women's Equality Day, just as I end up speaking during Women's History Month. But it is an important day. And it's a great time for all of us. Uh, and I appreciate uh, the prayer for all of us as citizens to understand this journey and what it means. Now, because it's you guys, we said, oh, this is about WMD. Women making a difference. <laughs> so from now on, when you see WMD, I want that to be in your head. Nice. <laughs> well, let's start with the first slide. This is actually a pretty long journey. And it is about rights. And to be honest, it started off as a journey about freedom of speech. This is Sarah and Angela Grimke. Well, one sister was born in 1792 and the other was born in 1805. They were, they were born and raised in a slave-holding family uh, in South Carolina. And, and as they grew up, uh, they felt that this whole institution of slavery was wrong. And they became vocal vocal opponents to slavery and were forced to relocate to the north. They became Quakers, and in the Quaker religion, they could, in church, speak as women. But outside of the church, speaking on the topic of abolition, speaking against slavery, it wasn't norm in society. So they're adults in the 1830s. They finally find their voice through newspapers in the North, like the Liberator, and they start writing articles about slavery and condemning slavery and encouraging women of the South to also find their voice and help convince people that slavery is wrong. And then they got feedback. Women writing about slavery, freedom of speech. It was just unheard of. And later on, they actually got death threats but they persevered. And then the sister did something really outrageous. They decided to start talking about this right to speak. Women have a right to free speech. Well, was that or was that not true? Their status, our status as women, our status as uh, Negroes in those days, we really weren't full-fledged citizens. And so despite all of this animosity, they continue to say, we have a right to speak. Next slide. Lucretia Mott 
is a Quaker, and she's the friend of the Grimkes. In fact, she's about the same age. She's also friends with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was born in 1815. And so she's a teenager at the time the Grimkes are writing and giving, talking about this right to speak. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is definitely a rebel. It must have been a hard time being her mom and dad. And by the time she's ready to get married, she says, I am not going to have the word obey in my marriage ceremony. <laughs> wow. And they didn't. <laughs> but for women at this time frame, now we're in the late 1830s, 1840s, women did not enjoy many of their rights. They didn't have the right to own property. And so when you married, everything you owned went to your husband. And then if your husband passed away, everything you owned went to the next male person. And so you literally could have your own wealth as a woman, but the minute you married, it was gone. Control of property was gone. For Elizabeth, this was really about property rights, as well as the right to speak. Both she and Lucretia, and they were abolitionists, found that they would go to abolitionist meetings and they would not be allowed to speak. And they had enough of that. So they decided to put together the Seneca Falls Connection Convention in 1848. They are going to draft a sentiment, a declaration of sentiments about women's rights. Uh, they advertised in the newspaper, and then they start talking about what should this convention be about, and what rights should we declare for ourselves, and start this conversation across this country. And so, of course, freedom of speech is up front. Property rights are up front. And then Elizabeth Cady Stanton on her porch to Lucretia goes, we need to add the right to vote. And poor Lucretia goes, Cady, you will make us look ridiculous. It was such a far-fetched concept. There was no way it was going to happen. But they put together the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention. Many people came. But the, and everybody agreed on putting out this Declaration of Women's Rights. The convention almost fell apart <clears throat> when they got to whether or not women's right to vote should be in this declaration. And literally, Frederick Douglass stood up and gave one of the best speeches of his life and convinced everybody that citizenship, citizenship is, is a right to all human beings. And this is a man who's a, a slave on the lamb and has no rights himself. And they signed the Declaration of Sentiments. It was well published. They had such hostility after that that almost every signer within the next year said, I didn't mean to sign. And by the time we fast forward to the, uh, when women finally get the right to vote, only one of the signers who was basically a teenager was still, still alive when that occurred. But that convention put us on this path of a great dialogue and movement that women have a right to speak. Women have a right to own property. <clears throat> women have a right to vote. And so it got picked up by Lucy Stone, who also knew both uh, Stanton and Mott. And in her adulthood, started an, an American Suffrage Association to keep pushing forward with this dialogue and uh, conventions and saying, we have a right to vote. And she, too, believed in full emancipation as a human being. And so when Lucy Stone got married, she said, I'm getting married, but I'm keeping my own name. That was really radical in the 1800s. But her husband agreed, said, absolutely. You are an emancipated human being, and I am too. Next slide. So their work continues on. In the end, there's a falling out between Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucy Stone, and it was really the Civil War, and it came down to the amendment that gave African Americans the right to vote. Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, we should be pushing that the right to vote should be for women as well as black men. Uh, and Lucy Stone said, no, if, let's do this first step, and then eventually we will get to the point where women have the right to vote. And so they separated. 
But the different movements that they started continued on. And now we're up into the 19th century. And it really starts to come to the forefront in 1912. 1912. You've got Woodrow Wilson running for president, Theodore Roosevelt running for president. Who knew Theodore Roosevelt in his campaign, he's like, yes, women should have the right to vote. Woodrow Wilson was kind of lukewarm. At the Republican convention, women were there, suffragi suffragettes were there at the Republican convention holding these great signs. This is 1912 going, you know, for the safety of the nation, a woman's right to vote. The hand that rocks the cradle will never rock the vote. <laughs> Wilson gets the uh, nomination. He becomes president. 1916, he occasionally meets with suffragettes. But in reality, he's not so much into women voting. And so they started to picket outside the White House very consistently. And in 1917, Woodrow Wilson's on his way out of the White House. There's women anti-war protesters, there's women suffragette protesters, there's other anti-war protesters, and then there's people who are like, we should help defend the world. There's this huge mashup outside the White House and everybody gets arrested, including the women suffragettes. We want the right to vote. They're all in jail. The women suffragettes start a hunger strike. And then that gets in the paper. And so finally, Wilson, says, let them out of jail and to pacify them and get these women from stop protesting outside the White House, agrees to have the amendment introduced in 1918, believing it's never going to pass, that women would have the right to vote. Well, guess what? 1920, it passed. It was ratified. And that's why we have this day. It is recognition of all, literally, Literally, at that point, over 100 years worth of work by both men and women for women to have the right to vote, as well as free speech. Next slide. But in some ways, the movement continues. And as women move into the workplace, it becomes clear we don't have the same opportunities as men. And in 1963, women were only making like 53 cents on the dollar to men. So President Kennedy signed out an equal opportunity. He signed out an equal pay amendment. And women started to move into the workforce. We're, we're like 40, 46% of the labor workforce today. We are actually 51% of the population in the United States. And then uh, 2007, there was a equal opportunity lawsuit where Lily Ledbetter sued a Goodyear tire and rubber company. She figured out that the other men at her level were getting a lot more money for the same work. Her case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, initially she won and she got 3.3 million in, in damages and back pay. But then Goodyear appealed and it went to the Supreme Court. And fundamentally, the Supreme Court in a very close decision, five to four, said, yes, we're not saying you weren't discriminated against, but we're saying that you really can't sue for back wages prior to the time you made your claim. And so in 2009, current president signed out the Lilly Ledbetter Act, which basically says, if you file a discrimination suit and it's, in your, it's, in, it's found in your favor that there really was discrimination at your organization, you can receive back pay. Unfortunately for Lilly, it was too late. She not only lost with the Supreme Court, Goodyear filed against her to pay for their lawyer's fees, which she had to pay. Now the reason when the Lilly Ledbetter Act was signed in 2009, you see all the congresswomen uh, and Senator Mikulski there, uh, all, why are they wearing red? They're trying to point out that women today were now making about 76 cents on the dollar. So it takes women about <clears throat> 15 months of labor to reach the same level of income as a male who works for 12 months. And so they refer to this as, we are in the red, whether you're a minority or a woman. And so we still have a little ways to go. We have come very far from 1920 in that amendment. But we, we still have other areas where we can get to better equality in this country. And I refer to it, since I take an oath to the Constitution, that all of us get to enjoy the full rights that are guaranteed us in the 10, that first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights. 
So that's sort of where we are. But then that gets us to you. And you guys are basically a technical uh, organization, engineering, math, science. And so when you think about who works for you and who does what, is it here? And, it are, and is this really just this group a reflection of what America looks like? So let me give you a test I, I often give to folks. I'd like you to close your eyes. I promise to stay up here on the stage. <laughs> close your eyes. <clears throat> and when I say the word scientist, scientist, What's the image that comes into your mind? Ma'am. And is there anybody who, open your eyes, is there anybody who'd be willing to stand up and tell me what image came into their mind with the word scientist? Yes, ma'am. A man that's highly knowledgeable. Did you have any specific image? Well dressed. Normally I get pocket protector. <laughs> Trying to get better improvement. That's a great image. So thank you. It takes a courage to be the first one to stand up and answer. Courage is a core value in the Navy, so I like to reward courage taken. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> Nineteen eighty-three. This guy started this uh, um, in order to understand when stereotyping starts. Said he has this. It's been going on for decades. He asks school kids to draw a scientist test, and of course, that's a seventh-grade boy's version of a scientist. But in reality, <laughs> that is our perspective of scientists, and so it's hard for that is. Our belief, whether you're a man or a woman, most some people, the other common one I get is Einstein. Not Madame Curie, Einstein. And so if that is our belief set, we have mental belief sets we have to break through in order to make sure women get into engineering and, and math and, and science. And so one of the things I wanted to do today was help break open the stereotypes of what an innovator looks like. Next slide. Who's this? Vivian Lee. Nope, not Vivian Lee. Lee. Hmm? Lee. Nope, not May West. She's blonde hair. Eva Gardner? Close, not Eva Gardner, no. Hedy Lamar, come on down. <laughs> Hedy Lamar came to this country in the 1930s. Hollywood actress. Who said Hedy? Come on down, Hedy. Yeah. How do you know Hedy Lamar? <laughs> you watch old black and white movies? Thank you. Women's history. You hear a lot of women's <laughs> history. Absolutely. <laughs> Hedy Lamar was uh, considered, you know, in my culture, aviators have call signs. Hedy's moniker in Hollywood was the most beautiful woman in Hollywood. 36 films, over 28 years. Probably her most famous was Samson and Delilah. Hetty uh, came to this country just as the storm clouds were brewing in Europe. She had been married to a munitions factory owner. And she happens to be a smart woman. And uh, so actress by daytime, her hobby was tinkering. She kept a draft, draft board in her home in Hollywood. and. Um, World War II comes along, and Hetty gets interested in wireless uh, guided torpedoes. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to break your stereotype here, what an innovator looks like. <laughs> so Hetty's next door neighbor happens to be a composer. He writes, you know, the show scores for movies, and they start talking about, you know, the war and munitions and wireless guided torpedoes. Turns out her next door neighbor, George Anthill, he collects antique pianos. That's his hobby, and it makes sense. He's a musician and a composer. Now, does anybody here know how a roller piano works? The old 
antique pianos from the 1800s. One, anybody willing to stand up and give it a shot? One shaking lieutenant head. <laughs> no one? I asked this question once, and a guy stood up. It was over at SSP, and it turns out that's his hobby. <laughs> I was like, I've got several, I don't know. <laughs> no, no one wants to say, none of you saw any like that when you were visiting museums as a kid? All right, let me walk you through it. So you have a roller piano, and, and basically what it is, is you have a long, voluminous sheet with, the different, with different holes struck in it. And then as it rolls through, cranks through, those holes match up to pins. And then as the pins move through the holes, those are mechanically geared to the different uh, uh, pikes that, that line up to the actual key on the piano. So is this different holes? So then it, the piano's playing, looks like it's playing itself, but it's really just pre-staged what these holes are to make the, make the piano keys move. <coughs> so Hetty is talking to George, and they're talking about wireless guided torpedoes. And she goes, well, you know, the real issue is you've got this signal. And when you think about signals, they're continuous, right? And as long as that continuous tone is going, or signal is going to the torpedo, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do what you want it to do. That's the communication path. And Hetty goes, the problem is that can be disrupted. Somebody could cut that signal off, and then you know the torpedo doesn't do its job. So she goes, why do we have a continuous signal? Why don't we move that signal and put it into burst so that it's harder for someone to cut off? And she got the idea from the piano roll, from those holes. She goes, you can get the signal and the sound enough movement fast enough without having a continuous beam. And that means you, the torpedo can't be jammed. Frequency hopping. Hetty Lamar invented frequency hopping. <laughs> Patent, 1942, her and George. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she tried to turn it over to the Navy. Do you think we took it? No. <laughs> 1963 off of Cuba, we go, wow, this is a pretty good thing. <laughs> 1997, the Electronic Frontier Company called Hetty out of retirement and said, oh my God, you wrote the patent of frequency hopping. We would like to honor you. And she goes, it's about to tie. <laughs> Her patent is the basis behind Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. You don't have to look like a mad scientist <laughs> to be creative and innovative and technically smart. You can look like anything you want to look like, including being the most beautiful woman in the world. Next slide. But there is, it is important to have role models. Um, most of the services are involved with the Center for Creative Leadership. And at different points in our careers, they either provide us 360 surveys or we go and get additional training from them on leadership. And then we sit in with folks from different communities. They have been running a survey on military leaders about what is the most important thing, factor in being a good leadership. And they list different things. You know, was it, is it experience? Is it mentoring? The most common response, almost half the people, regardless of rank, say it's a positive role model. Positive role model. And so we have to sometimes make ourselves aware of positive role models, like Hetty, to know that things are possible. So in this case, I've got Dr. Shirley Jackson up. She's the first African-American woman to get a doctorate from MIT in physics. And she's currently the president of Rensselaer Polytech. And for a while, she was the head of the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. I've got um, Juan Andong, who uh, had bachelors in both chemistry and computer engineering, and worked for the Navy over at the Naval Warfare Surface Center in, in um, Indian Head. And she helped put together the team 
that in a very expedited manner brought a series of munitions forward during the middle of Operation Enduring Freedom. She's the one credited with sort of bringing the um, thermal barrack bomb to bear, the one that helped destroy the caves in Afghanistan. She received a national medal for that. She currently works for Homeland Security. And then uh, Becky Ollinger, um, who uh, is a material expert at Los Alamos and just likes to blow things up, according to her. <laughs> but she's also a huge STEM advocate and goes out to the local high schools and, and elementary schools talking about the importance of engineering and math. And they are important. But when we talk about what women make on the dollar, some of it, I think, is just where we are and the occupations we've chosen. And when you talk about engineering um, and science and technology and math, those tend to be better paying jobs. And we are very capable and innovative. Next slide. So where are we going? Well, there's role models out there. You just have to look for them. So, Sunita Williams is a Naval Academy graduate, helicopter pilot, diving, basic diver qualified, test pilot. Uh, masters in engineering management who started to work for NASA about 1998 and uh, getting she'll probably be one of the first astronauts once we get to the point where commercial industry provides space flight she'll probably be one of the first astronauts she's supposed to be one of the first astronauts to go up on a commercial platform by say government platform so we're out there help spread the word and then stereotypes just really are important for the people coming up. Last month, I was on a phone call with Rear Admiral Hotenu of the Nigerian Navy. She's the first woman to make admiral, and actually the equivalent to general, in any of the armed forces in Nigeria. And she made two stars. She'll be retiring later this year. Uh, her degree's an architect, and she ended up in logistics in the Nigerian Navy and of course was the first at everything she ever did on her way up to making two star. She told me this great story. Uh, when she was a commander and the senior woman officer <laughs> in the Nigerian Navy at the time uh, and with an engineering background, she was just on the internet one day thinking about engineering and women and she came across a website on Grace Hopper. And Grace Hopper is, you know, inventor of COBOL, admiral in my Navy, appointed by Congress, uh, but really the heart and soul behind computer engineering as we know it today. And so when she saw this and read about Grace Hopper, she goes, I had never heard of this woman. It was fantastical to me. And that she was an engineer and became an admiral. She printed off and cut off Grace Hopper's picture and stuck it on her cork board when she was a commander. And she thought about Grace Hopper and what that meant to her and then what she might mean to others as she continued on that journey up. So we need leaders, role models who look like us to help inspire us, and help us move forward. And then finally, you think about where I started from with the Grimke sisters, the right to speak, all the way up through the Seneca Falls Convention, all the way up to this last century and today, and our right to vote. About 66% of the women in this country registered to vote. And in the last election, 46% of us voted. There are a lot of leaders, men and women, who invested a lot of time to give us this right. Please, you have the privilege of full citizenship. Please exercise it. Speech, vote, right to be an entrepreneur, and to help lead this country into the next century. So thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I have time for a few questions. <laughs> no questions. Everybody's happy. Oh, uh, I, I have several. You know, I would say my mom and dad initially, and then um, when I was little, they would give me different books to read, and I was enamored. First of all, I was enamored with Queen Elizabeth I and that whole flotilla thing, <laughs> kick the Spanish Armada. Yeah. 
Uh, Harriet Tubman, when I first read about her, I was fascinated uh, by a woman who'd been a slave who escaped into freedom and then had the courage to go back and lead others into freedom. And then she ended up as a, working for the uh, Union Army as a scout during the Civil War and actually eventually got um, um, veterans benefits at the end of the war for her, her service as a scout. Um, and then as I uh, transitioned into the Navy, um, I was aware of Grace Hopper, but one of the people I met when I was a lieutenant commander um, was CNO uh, Zumwalt, uh, who was retired at that point, and I heard him speak a couple of different times. He was a champion of diversity. He was the youngest CNO we ever had, and uh, he helped bring in women admirals uh, and help get the Navy on a footing of where we treat people equally. And he did this uh, despite the culture of the Navy and realized he had to lead the Navy to, a, to be in a better place and how we think of our people and that everyone, once they put the uniform on, is a sailor. And to put it into context, when he was CNL, shortly after he came into office, we had, um, we, we had sit-downs on carriers. The black sailors were so sick of being treated poorly. They were literally doing sit-downs on carriers and refusing to get the carriers to see. I mean, it was, a nat it was a crisis that unfolded nationally. And he just said, there's something wrong with my Navy when we don't treat every sailor like a sailor. And he put us on a footing that, you know, really led to the Navy we have today. And that, that's, he was charismatic, but also persistent as a leader, and I took a lot from hearing him speak. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, could you follow that thread and just give us a view of what you see in today's Navy, going on particularly uh, the role of women in various combat roles and so forth? Abso absolutely. So, the, for gender integration, the services are actually on different tracks and milestones. Uh, for the Navy, um, when I started Annapolis, women could serve on hospital ships uh, as nurses and doctors. Uh, and, and women nurses serving on ships actually starts with the Army, serving on some, like 1908, on a hospital ship, the Relief. But women could not serve in the, what would be the equivalent to combat arms. And so while I'm at Annapolis, um, there was a lawsuit. After World War II, uh, we, had a, we, we had the combat exclusion law, which basically said women couldn't serve on combatant ships or fly aircraft in combat. And uh, the Navy, to simplify it, just said, we just won't have you serve on any ships but hospital ships. And so a group of women sued and said, no, not every ship's a combative ship. They're not all warships. They're, some of them are support ships. So the Navy changed policy while I was at Annapolis. And they opened up salvage ships, support ships. So by the time I graduated, we were just starting putting women to sea uh, as officers and enlisted. But then what it did is it opened up lots of different ratings to enlisted women. Pretty much had been administrators, but now they could be quartermasters and um, machinist mates. Then in the 80s, we opened up ammunition ships and oilers, and we opened up the entire logistics fleet to women. So by the time Desert Storm comes around, um, we had about 2,000 women serving on support ships uh, in Desert Storm. And then for us and for the Air Force, the big change was the repeal of the combat exclusion law uh, in 94. Well, that opened up everything, cruisers, destroyers. So since then, you know, we've had more women uh, in command of destroyers and cruisers and, and other ships than I can count. Um, we've had, gosh, four years ago, we had our first woman command a carrier strike group. We had our first three-star fleet commander a few years ago, 10th fleet, and then Nora Tyson just took over as third fleet. Um, and, and these are women aviators. Uh, we had, a few years ago, our first woman carrier air group commander, fighter pilot. She transitioned, when the combat exclusion law repealed, she transitioned from um, support aircraft into fighters, and she ended up commanding a fighter squadron and then a carrier group uh, in combat. And, for example, the head of the CB Corps, 
which our senior CB is a two-star, is a woman right now, classmate of mine. So for us, when that law was repealed, it just opened up just about everything. What we still had closed at the time were submarines and uh, special forces, because they're direct ground combat. And then we opened up submarines four years ago. And we've started with women officers, and women enlisted will start going to submarines in 2016. So what's left closed in the Navy is SEALs. Uh, and so then, I'm sure all of you are aware, that's the big decision <laughs> for SECDEF um, this, this coming October. And so he'll, SOCOM and the other services will make recommendations to him on infantry, armored, special forces. And so we'll see where we're going. One more question? Sure. Yes, sir. Um, why the Navy and was the military service your initial or primary uh, choice as a career? Uh, yes, so, yes. Yes. The, so let me answer two first and then one. Um, so I was 12 and I saw this documentary on TV and I was like, wow, service academy. I want to do that. I don't know if it was the leadership and the thought of being in charge or if it was the uniforms. <laughs> But I thought it was pretty neat. So I go to my older brother, and um, he said, oh, well, you can't go. Service academies are closed to women. It's the law. What? <laughs> I, was, I was in shock. Yeah, but it was true. It was the law. Women couldn't go to service academies. So I went to my mother, and I was, I was just stunned. It just didn't seem fair to me. And she said, well, that's, that's true. But you're young. Um, and, but years from now, if you still want to go and you want to apply, we'll go ahead and apply, and then if you're denied, we'll sue the government. She's <laughs> <laughs> like 72. <laughs> and then she made me go look up words like precedents, lawsuits, you know. Like but she said, think about it. She also made it a teaching moment. She goes, there's going to be things in life that you want to do that the law says you can't do. And she says it's, it's up to you to go after things where people say no if you believe it to be right. And she said if it is right, the government, the Supreme Court will eventually agree with you. She said, but the way things work is it could take a long, long time. And she said by the time you get to yes, you could be too old to go to a service academy. And she said, but if it's the right thing to do, by the time you get to yes, that means some other women will get to go because you did the right thing. And she said, that, that is just as important. Mm -hmm. So fight for what's right. That's what she taught me. The service academy opened up in 76, and uh, I applied uh, when I was my junior year in high school. And then why Navy? I did research and went to the library and said, hmm, I knew when I graduated I'd be going into a military service. Whatever women could do in the Army, they could, I could do if I went Marine Corps. And whatever women could fly in the Air Force, if that was where I was going to go, women could fly the same things in, uh, in the Navy. And I said, well, this gives me the most options. And of course, ships weren't open. That happened while I was there. And then I ended up going into ships. So that's, that's, a, that's a great question to end with. Thank you. But it is, it is a great reminder of all of our obligations as citizens to fight for what we think is right. So thank you for spending time with me today. On behalf of the Headquarters Complex Equal Employment Opportunity Offices, I would like to extend the special thanks to Admiral Howard and to each one of you for participating in today's program. This concludes our Women's Equality Day observance. We invite you to greet Admiral Howard in the rotunda as you leave the auditorium and to view the various exhibits highlighting women in the U.S. military.
We also invite you to enjoy a documentary entitled Unsung Heroes, The Story of America's Female Patriots, which will be shown in the Headquarters Complex cafeteria today at 11.30. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our, our ceremony. Please remain in place until the front two rows of senior leaders have exited.